Well, we want to welcome you this morning. We're picking up in the book of Judges the last three chapters. So the conclusion of the matter, as we see in a land and in a time when there was no king in Israel and everyone did that which was right in their own eyes. So we see uh, anarchy. You know, we're kind of on the heels when, uh, of some major upheavals in our own country. But in this study, we'll see the people had degraded to a point of Sodom and Gomorrah. So without saying too much more, uh, we will kind of review the last couple of chapters. It's our desire on Sunday mornings that we go verse by verse, chapter by chapter, through the whole Bible. Why? Because we want you to understand the scriptures, be able to apply them to your lives and let him impact you. When you understand God and you love God more, then you can love other people more and you're, you'll have wisdom for your life. So that's why we're studying verse by verse through the scriptures. Let us pray. Father, thank you for the power of your word that you would speak boldly and clearly to our hearts this morning. May you move in power in Jesus' name that we may learn from the failures and pitfalls of those who came before. In your powerful name we pray and everyone said, amen, amen. So we just came off the heels of chapters 16 uh, or 17 and 18 where there was a man from Ephraim who was an idolater. He was a Levite of sorts, but he was hired. Uh, his name was Micah. He was hired to be a priest that served idols in this one man's home. And then the tribe of Dan came and they recruited him and they gave him a pay raise. So the last couple of chapters, we see this, this weird idolatry of the tribe of Dan. And then they attack this innocent city called Laish or Laish. And when they attack that city of unwalled villages that was peaceful, 27 miles east of Sidon, off of the coast of Israel, it was wicked. And we note that in Revelation 7, when all of the 12 tribes are mentioned in the 144,000, Dan is not mentioned. So Dan, in some ways, could have, uh, because of their idolatry, sealed the deal that God basically did not regard them as a covenant people. And so we see the two tribes of Joseph, of Ephraim and Manasseh, making up the other two tribes. There's always been a baker's dozen because the two sons of Joseph made up two tribes. So there were literally 13 tribes. Levites were spread throughout all the tribes. But interestingly, as we read of the idolatry of the Danites or the tribe of Dan, we see that they are not included in the 144,000 because of their idolatry in the north of the land. They left the, the southern part of Israel, moved up to the very far north, and that made them subject to the actual uh, captivity of the Assyrians, which I believe was around 720 B.C. or 780 B.C. And I think it was 720. And then in 586 B.C., when the Babylonians finally took over the southern kingdom, Dan was that tribe in the north with the Assyrians that kind of paved the way. And that's where we get the Samaritans, which were in a way a hybrid or ethnic a group of amalgam of the Babylonians, the Assyrians, and all different cultures, because that's how they conquered the northern kingdoms. We'll see that later uh, the southern kingdom was taken off to Babylon. We have Daniel, Ezekiel, Jeremiah was left behind, and we saw that that captivity, hopefully, and, and we seem to think that it rid, it rid the Israelites of idolatry, because they realized God was dealing with them for 70 years, and many of them, Zerubbabel, uh, Zerubbabel and Nehemiah and Ezra, the scribe, came back. They rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem that started the prophetical timepiece or time clock for Jesus to return as it was prophesied in the book of Daniel. And we see that when Jesus rode on the donkey, the glorious or the triumphant entry on the donkey, it was to the very day that was prophesied by Daniel that it would be 483 years from the time that the edict was made to restore and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. That was the very day in April of 32 AD, I believe, or 33 AD, when Jesus came into this town because he fulfilled the true liberation of the captivity, the true spiritual liberation by coming to die for our sins in Jerusalem. Now, as we look at this, uh, in chapter 19, we see another Levite from Ephraim, but this Levite, in, in sense, was 
kind of of the wilderness. So we'll call him a hillbilly Levite, okay? So he was kind of a, a journeyman, okay? And it came to pass in those days, verse 1 of chapter 19, when there was no king in Israel, that there was a certain Levite staying in the remote mountains of Ephraim. He took for himself a concubine from Bethlehem and Judah. What? He had a concubine. What is that? It's a female servant. And as we read in Genesis, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. What God has brought together, let not man pull apart or separate, right? So this, this Levite, this priestly tribe of the children of Israel, he had a woman that he had as a servant and however it would treat as a mistress. And this is very wicked, right? This is the pinnacle. This is what God is trying to illustrate to us when you have no king, God, to rule over you. And when there are uh, people just doing what is right in their own eyes. But his concubine played the harlot against him and went away from him to her father's house in Bethlehem of Judah and was there for four whole months. So we can tell that this was a romantic mistress of sorts because she, she left him, was unfaithful to him, and then she went to her father's house, almost like a bride would do, right? And he's coming after her. And it's, uh, Josephus said, as the story goes, he was a Jewish historian during the time of Christ, and he said that this woman, she did not love her master, the Levite, and she fell in love with another. And so she left, and as it says there in the scripture, then her husband arose and went after her to speak kindly to her and bring her back, having his servant and a couple of donkeys with him. So she brought him into her father's house, and when the father of the young woman saw him, he was glad to meet him. So... He brought a couple of donkeys, and he's all of a sudden Casanova, smooth-talking, sweetheart, oh, honey, oh, beautiful, would you please come back with me? And so she is wooed by him and says, why don't you come into my father's house? And the father's like, oh, no, because I've been harboring this woman who left her, my daughter, who left her, her master, and he says, well, I'm, it looks like he's happy. Let's let him in. So hospitality he lets this man into his home. Now his father-in-law, the young woman's father, detained him and he stayed with him three days so that they ate and drank and lodged there. So they're eating and drinking. They're having a cold one. Then it came to pass on the fourth day that they arose early in the morning that he stood to depart. But the young woman's father said to the son-in-law, Hey, refresh your heart with a morsel of bread and afterward go your way. He's like, hey, come on, stay for a little bit longer. So they sat down and the two of them ate and drank together. Then the young woman's father said to the man, please be content to stay here all night and let your heart be merry. Now, if you've read Genesis, this kind of reminds you of Eleazar, the servant who came to find a bride for Isaac. Or it reminds you of Jacob and Laban and how Jacob came and uh, he fled from Esau, his brother, and Laban, his uncle, is like, hey, why don't you come here, and why don't you take one of my, my daughters as your bride? And there's this hospitality of the Jewish people, but also in that, that area where it's like, hey, what's the hurry, right? We're, so go, go, go. But he's like, stay here longer. And so it happens again. He rose in the morning on the fifth day to depart, but the young woman's father said, please refresh your heart. So they delayed until afternoon, and both of them ate. And when the young man stood to depart, he and his concubine and his servant, his father-in-law, the young woman's father, said to him, Look, the day is drawing toward the evening. Please spend the night. See, the day is coming to an end. Lodge here and that your heart may be merry. Tomorrow go your way early so that you may get home. However, the man was not willing to spend the night, so he arose and departed, and he came to the opposite Jebus, which is Jerusalem, with him, were the two saddled donkeys and the concubine was also with him. Okay, so hospitality, hospitality. Hey, stay a while. What's the hurry? He does this three days. The fourth day, he wants to leave. So he's already antsy. He wants to get back home. He's like, okay. First, my concubine runs away, which he shouldn't have had a concubine, but he's like, my lady runs away. I go to her dad's house. I'm here three days. It's time to go. Fourth day, it's time to go. Fifth day, he's getting antsy. He's like, I'm at the door. I'm out of here. And the father's like, hey, stick around. Let's have another brewski. Having wine, having food. 
Well, he's waiting so late at the end of the day that now he's going to be traveling by night, which is dangerous, right? So the father's trying to say, hey, stay, stay. He's like, no. So he goes near Jerusalem where the Jebusites were. Now, the Jebusites were not Jews. They were Gentiles. They were people of the land of Canaan. And his mistake here, or what he thought, is that these Jebusites would be nicer to him and his bride than the people of Israel. Let's see what happens here. But his master said to him, we will not turn aside here into the city. Because the servant was saying, hey, let's go to the Jebusites. Let's go to Jebus. Let's just rest in Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem's up on a hilltop. It's very well protected. And at this time, it had never been conquered by David. It was never, it was, it was always, it's a stronghold. It's a beautiful place. But this Levite, because he's so wise in his own eyes, he says, no way. And he says, we will not turn aside here to the city of foreigners who are not the children of Israel. We will go to Gibeah. Surely Gibeah would be better, he thought. So he said to his servant, come, let us draw to one, near to one of these places and spend the night at Gibeah or in Ramah. And they passed by and went their way. And the sun went down on them near Gibeah, which belongs to Benjamin. Last night I was working on putting some soil down, some topsoil in our yard. It got dark quick. Between 6 and 6.30, right? It gets dark very, very quickly. And it cools off. So he, they were ready to stop traveling. They're like, hey, let's go to Gibeah, which belongs to Benjamin. So they're in the south uh, part of Israel near uh, Gibeah and the land of Benjamin. They turn aside and they go to lodge in Gibeah. They're to go into lodge near, uh, in, in Gibeah. And when they went in, he sat down in the open square of the city, probably near the gate. For no one would take him in into his house to spend the night. So he has all this, he has all the stuff he needs, but no one would take him in. Hmm, that sounds familiar. Who, who found no room in the inn, right? Jesus wasn't even accepted in his own, uh, in his own hometown of Bethlehem, which is interesting because that's where he had to go. This is Bethlehem that he just left. So the old, there was an old man who came in from his work in the field at evening who also was from the mountains of Ephraim. So you've got Hillbilly and Hick. And the old man, he's like, hey, that's one of my countrymen. What is he doing out there in the open square? And whereas the men of the place were Benjamites, these guys were from Ephraim. And when he raised his eyes, he saw the traveler and he op in the open square of the city. And the old man said, where are you going? And where do you come from? So he said to him, we are passing from Bethlehem in Judah to the remote mountains of Ephraim. I am from there. I went to Bethlehem in Judah. And now I'm going to the house of the Lord. But there is no one who will take me into his house. Although we have both straw and fodder for our donkeys and a female servant. Oh, and bread and wine for myself, for your female servant and for the young man who is with your servant. But there is no lack of anything. And the old man said, peace be with you. However, let all your needs be my responsibility. Only do not spend the night in the open square. So he brought him into his house and gave fodder to the donkeys, so food for the donkeys, and they washed their feet and ate and drank. Okay, verse 20, it's kind of subtle, but he says, hey, don't stay out here in the, in the open square. And we'll see why he warned him of that. And then he showed hospitality. He said, just like the father of the concubine, he's like, hey, come stay at my house. I'll take care of you, okay? Maybe we've lost a little bit of that heart of hospitality, but I hope that we all have a hospitable heart. The New Testament tells us to be hospitable. We never know when we'll be entertaining angels. We should be uh, willing to take people into our homes and to, to host them for lunches, dinners, and to take care of people as they travel. But much more so in this time when there were no hotels. Okay, verse 22. As they were enjoying themselves, suddenly certain men of the city, perverted men, surrounded the house and beat on the door. Imagine, right? They're beating on the door. They spoke to the master of the house, the old man, saying, Bring out the man who came to your house that we may know him carnally. But the man, the master of the house, went out to them and said to them, No, my brethren, I beg you, do not act so wickedly. See, this man has come into my house and do not commit this outrage. Look, here is my virgin daughter and the man's concubine. Let let me bring them out now, humble them, and do with them as you please. But to this man, do not do such a vile thing. Right? Do you guys remember 
in Sodom. Lot, chapter 19 of Genesis, verse 5. The men of Sodom beat on the house of Lot because he had these two angels that look like men. And here, they're beating on the door saying, let the men come out that we may know them carnally. Here in Judges 19, you see an echo of Genesis 19 where the men of this tribe of Benjamin in this town wanted to literally have their way with this Levite. Now what's alarming here in verse 24 is this man who is being hospitable said, you can have my virgin daughter and the concubine and do what you will with them. In the scriptures, well, throughout the world, there may be some reform in the Muslim world, but many places in the world today, women are regarded as having less rights, if any rights, are treated as property. What's beautiful about the scriptures is we see clearly that Jesus exalted women to their rightful place. And he said, there's neither male nor female, bond nor free, Scythian nor barbarian, nor Jew nor Gentile, but all are one in Christ and Jesus. When he had his feet washed by the woman, he said, this will be remembered of her and told whenever this story is read, whenever the gospels are preached, the woman who anointed his feet, the woman he met at the well, he said, go and sin no more, the Samaritan woman, the women who were at the cross, the women who saw him first after the resurrection, Jesus gave rights to women in the beauty and elegance that only he could and that is he treated them with equality. Not in a political way that says they're more than or less than or needs certain special. They're different, but they're equal in the sight of God. Jesus exalted women. And Jesus did more for women than any other act, policy, or person, or religion ever because he is God. And God made man and woman in his image. Amen? But here we see a atrociously wicked picture because he says, do whatever is right uh, to these women. Let me bring them out, humble them and do with them as you please. Literally, that phrase means whatever is right in your own eyes. So he says in a very postmodern relativistic way that we see today, whatever you feel is right, do whatever you feel like. So this is where it turns terrible. He says, don't, don't hurt my guests. That would be vile. That would be wicked. But take these women. That's wicked. That's more wicked to me. They're all, both equally wicked. But the men would not heed him. They want to listen to him. So the men took the concubine, took his concubine, and they brought her out to them. So these two men brought the concubine out, and they knew her and abused her, and all night until morning, and when the day began to break, they let her go. So they raped her, and they assaulted this woman. Poor woman. Then the woman came as the day was dawning and fell at the door of the man's house where her master was till it was light. When her master arose in the morning, he opened the doors of the house and he went out to go his way. There was his concubine fallen at the door of the house with her hands on the threshold. Literally, she's grabbing the doorpost or right at the, the front of the door. And he said to her, get up and let us get going or let us be going. But there was no answer. So the man lifted her onto, his, onto the donkey and the man got up and went to his place. So this smooth talking, romantic, lovely guy, oh, sweet talking, oh, I love you, I love you. Now he's not nice at all. He's just brutal, right? And this is a Levite. This is supposed to be a priestly man. And that's how wicked he was. So he puts her on the donkey. It does not say that she's dead. No, it does not say that she's dead. It does not say that. When he entered his house, he took a knife. He laid hold of his concubine. He divided her into 12 pieces. This is just atrocious. Limb by limb, he sent her throughout the territory of Israel. And so it was that all who saw it said, no such deed has been done or seen from the day that the children of Israel came up from the land of Egypt until this day. Consider it, confer, and speak up. Just like 9-11, this was to create a shock wave through the nation of Israel to say, to say, never before has anything like this happened. Not in our world, not in our land, not in our country, not to our people. 
And what it did is it rallied all 400,000 of the men of Israel together to say, we must do something about this. As we go on to read, uh, we'll see in the book of 1 Samuel that Saul, the Benjamite, does something similar. He cuts a bowl into pieces, sends it to all the 12 tribes, and he says, whoever does not come to fight will end up to be like this bowl. They'll be dashed to pieces, basically. But like we said, we do not know whether he killed his, wife, his concubine or if he, she was killed by the assault that occurred to her. But nonetheless, you have this barbaric act. We're going to move on. It's awful. So all the children of Israel, chapter 20, came out from Dan to Beersheba. That's from north to south, the entire land of Israel. As well as from the land of Gilead, and the congregation gathered together as one man before the Lord at Mizpah. This is the one time in all of the book of Judges where all of the tribes of Israel gathered together. And it had to be because of outrage. And the leaders of all the people, all the tribes of Israel, presented themselves in the assembly of the people of God, 400,000 foot soldiers who drew the sword. Now the children of Benjamin heard that the children of Israel had gone up at Miz, to Mizpah. Then the children of Israel said, Tell us, how did this wicked deed happen? Basically, we want an answer. So the Levite, the husband of the woman who was murdered, answered and said, My concubine and I went into Gibeah, which belongs to Benjamin, to spend the night. And the men of Gibeah rose against me and surrounded the house at night because of me, and they intended to kill me, but instead they ravished my concubine so that she died. So I took hold of my concubine, cut her in pieces, and sent her throughout the territory and the inheritance of Israel because they committed lewdness and outrage in Israel. So once again, we don't know if he killed her, but he's blaming the Benjamites for killing her, and he sent her body parts throughout the, the land. Just disgusting. Look, all of you are children of Israel. Give your advice and counsel here and now. So this is kind of weird. You have a Levite asking the multitudes of the Israelites, what should I do? I mean, all of those men who did it should be put to death, period. He doesn't need their advice. He just needs to say, this is what needs to happen. But he's consulting with them. Give your advice and counsel here and now. So all the people arose as one man saying, none of us will go back to his tent, no uh, nor will any turn back to his house. But now this is the thing which we will do to Gibeah. We will go up against it by lot. We will take ten men out of, out of every hundred throughout all the tribes of Israel, a hundred out of every thousand, and a thousand out of every ten thousand to make provisions for the people. Then they will come to Gibeah in Benjamin. They may repay all the vileness that they have done in Israel." So all the men of Israel were gathered against the city, united together as one man. Then the tribes of Israel sent men through all the tribe of Benjamin, saying, What is this wickedness that has occurred among you? Now therefore, deliver up the men, the perverted men who are in Gibeah, that we may put them to death and remove the evil from Israel. But the children of Benjamin would not listen to the voice of their brethren, the children of Israel. So Benjamin they come to the tribe and they say, bring the perverts out so we can put them to death because we know this is outrage. Put them to death that we may rid evil from the land. There's no way to deal with perversion other than to cut it off and get rid of it in every one of our lives. If there's something perverted, if there's a sin of perversion that's infiltrating the church, we need to address it head on and explain expunge or get rid of it, cut it off. Jesus said, if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. Your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. This sin had to be eradicated. They were perverted. We don't use that word very much, but we have a very perverted, sexually perverted culture right now. Would you say amen to that? We have a very sexually perverted culture right now. And if that gets me locked up for saying it, our culture's by and large very perverted right now. And we need the wholesomeness and the purity of Jesus Christ, Amen. And he can do that. And this is what they're trying to say is we need to deal with it and remove them. But the tribe of Benjamin said, no way. Who cares? And that's what our world says today. Who cares about sexual perversion? We could pull the plug on pornography right now. We could close every triple 
whatever you want to call it, website down right now. Instead, they want to censor people who speak out against injustice and perversion. What's good is evil, what is evil is good in this culture that we live in. Instead, the children of Benjamin gathered together from the cities of Gibeah to go to battle against the children of Israel. Isn't this ironic? They're trying to help them and they're like, no, let's fight. And that's what the flesh wants to do. They want to fight and they rebel. There's a rebellion. And from their cities at that time, the children of Benjamin numbered 26,000 men who drew the sword besides the inhabitants of Gibeah who numbered 700 select men. Among all this people were 700 select men who were left-handed. Every one of them could sling a stone at a hair's breadth. Not one of them would miss. Now, I have an outline of the book of Judges, but if you remember, one of the original judges was Ehud of the tribe of Benjamin. What's ironic or funny about the tribe of Benjamin, it means son of my right hand, which means son of favor. Remember when uh, Rebecca was having a baby, her last child, she died. Joseph was her firstborn. Benjamin was her second. She called him ben Nomai, uh, son of my sorrow. And Jacob, or Israel, called his son Benjamin, son of my right hand. But they had left-handed southpaw warriors. And why is that significant? Well, you were seemingly disadvantaged to be left-handed in a battle because of the way they would skirmish in those days. But interestingly, Ehud was a left-handed warrior. And if you remember, when he killed... Uh, Deglon, or the, the king, he had a dagger that he grabbed with his left hand. And as he stabbed the king, the king's entrails and fat and blubber of his obesity swallowed up the knife or the dagger, if you recall. And he had to leave the dagger in him and he killed him and he fled out the window while the doors were locked. So it was just a, a weird passage, but because he was left-handed, it was unexpected. He surprised the king and killed him. But these left-handed warriors, there were 700 southpaws. Now, besides Benjamin, the men of Israel numbered 400,000 men who drew the sword. All of them were men of war, so valiant men. Then the, the children of Israel arose and went up to the house of God to inquire of God. And they said, which of us shall go up to battle against the children of Benjamin? And the Lord said, Judah first. Now, how did they know? They cast lots, kind of like the book of Acts. They drew straws or Jonah. They drew straws or cast lots. There's thoughts that it might have been the lights and perfections or the Urim and the Thummim uh, of the Levites, the black and the white stone, yes or no. And they may have asked each tribe and they got the tribe of Judah. The tribe of Judah was to go up first. Now, interestingly, the Lord said the tribe of Judah first. Who was of the tribe of Judah? The Lion of Judah, who was also from the root of Jesse. Jesus was from the tribe of Judah. Judah was preeminent. Judah, the scepter would not depart from Judah until Shiloh comes or the Messiah comes as Jacob prophesied over his sons. So Judah, the tribe of Jesus, the tribe of, of the king of kings was going to deal with this. Now, I think this very clearly foreshadows that when Jesus Christ comes again, the line of Judah, that he will judge. Sadly, there will be a sad judgment when Jesus comes. It's not going to be happy. It's very tragic and sad, just like we see in this story. So the children of Israel rose in the morning and encamped against Gibeah. And the men of Israel went out to battle against Benjamin. And the men of Israel put themselves in battle array to fight against them at Gibeah. Then the children of Benjamin came out of Gibeah and on that day cut down to the ground 22,000 men of the Israelites. So the Benjamites were fierce. As it says in the prophecy, I think of Genesis 49, that they would be like a snake that is along the trail and he would bite at the heels of the horse. The horse would fall back on its rider. They were... They were they would bite with a sting and avengers. They were very fierce soldiers. But they killed 22,000 Israelites, verse 22. And the people, that is the men of Israel, encouraged themselves and again formed the, the battle line at the place where they had put themselves in the array on the first day. Just think about 22,000 dead people lying on the ground. How, how dismal this was. Terrible. But they lined up for battle again. Then the children of Israel went up and they wept before the Lord until evening. And they asked counsel of the Lord saying, shall I again draw near for battle against the children of my brother Benjamin? And the Lord said, go up against him. So the Lord's speaking to them. They're seeking the Lord. And the children of Israel approached the children of Benjamin on the second day. And Benjamin went out against them from Gibeah. And on the second day, they cut down to the ground 18,000 more of the children of Israel. All these drew the sword. 
And then all the children of Israel, that is, all the people went up and came to the house of God and wept. They sat there before the Lord and fasted that day until evening, and they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. So they had grief and sorrow because they had just lost 40,000 people. You know, our church has about 500 people. Imagine 80 times the size of our church. 80 Glenvilles utterly destroyed because of this wicked rebellion. So the children of Israel inquired of the Lord. The Ark of the Covenant of God was there in those days. This is the only time we see the Ark of the Covenant mentioned in the book of, of Judges. And Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, stood before it in those days, saying, Shall I yet again go out into battle against the children of my brother Benjamin, or shall I cease? And the Lord answered and said, Go up, for tomorrow I will deliver them into your hand. Now this grief and sorrow that they're going through, they've lost 40,000 people. I want us to understand, I want me to understand, that God allows grief and sorrow in my life, in our lives, your life, he allowed it to happen and it led to worship. Notice they come before the ark and they cry out to the Lord and he desires our worship. If only we would worship before things have hit rock bottom, right? And that's why we come every week. We worship the Lord. We proclaim his name. We read his word. We praise his name and thank him in all things. So the Lord said, go up for tomorrow I will deliver them into your hand. Then Israel sent men in ambush all around Gibeah. So they, they put out spying men or hiding guerrilla warfare people all around the city. So they, they dug trenches or they hid behind bushes or wherever they hid. And the children of Israel went up against the children of Benjamin on the third day, and they put themselves in battle array against Gibeah as it, at the other times. So the children of Benjamin went out against the people, and they were drawn away from the city. So they began to strike down and kill some of the people as other times in the highways one which goes up from Bethel to Gibeah, or the other to Gibeah, and in the field, about 30 men of Israel. So 30 men of Israel have been killed, and they're chasing the men away from Gibeah, and they're striking them down and killing them. And the children of Benjamin said, They are defeated before us as at first. But the children of Israel uh, said, Let us flee and draw them away from the city into the highways, or to the highways. So all of the men of Israel rose from their place, and they put themselves in their battle array at Baal Tamar. Then Israel's men in ambush burst forth from their position in the plain of Geba. And 10,000 select men of the children of Israel or of all of Israel came against Gibeah and the battle was fierce. But the Benjamites did not know that disaster was upon them. So they came in stealth. So the Lord defeated Benjamin before Israel and the children of Israel destroyed that day 25,100 Benjamites, all of these who drew the sword. So the children of Benjamin saw that they were defeated. The men of Israel had given ground to the Benjamites because they had relied on the men in ambush whom they set against Gibeah. And the men in ambush quickly rushed upon Gibeah. The men in ambush spread out and struck the whole city with the edge of the sword. So they killed all men, women, children, animals. They destroyed all the city of Gibeah. Now this is very much like Bethel and Ai or Ai. In Joshua chapter 8, verse 4, if you remember, when they attacked Ai, they didn't seek the Lord, and many of the people were killed. The second time, they set ambush, and they set the city on fire, and the men of Ai lost heart, and they burned their city down, and they attacked them because they had them surrounded. So it's the same model that they had when they first came into the promised land. In Joshua chapter 8, verse 4, if you want to check that out. Verse 38 again, now uh, the appointed signal between the men of Israel and the men of ambush was that they would make a great cloud of smoke rise up from the city, whereupon the men of Israel would turn in battle. Now Benjamin had begun to strike and kill about 30 of the men of Israel, for they said, surely they are defeated before us as, is, as in the first battle. But when the cloud began to rise from the city in a column of smoke, the Benjamites looked behind them and they, there the whole city was going up in smoke to heaven. And when the men of Israel turned back, the men of Benjamin panicked. They were fearful, for they saw that, dis that disaster had come upon them. Therefore, they turned their backs before the men of Israel in the direction of the wilderness. But the battle overtook them, and whoever came out of the cities, destroyed, uh, they destroyed in their midst. 
They surrounded the Benjamites, chased them, and easily trampled them as far as the front of Gibeah toward the east. And 18,000 of the men of Benjamin fell. All these were men of valor. Then they turned and fled toward the wilderness at the rock of Rimon, and they cut down 5,000 men in the highways. Then they pursued them relentlessly to Gidom, and they killed 2,000 of them. So all who fell Benjamin that day were 25,000 men, plus 100, who drew the sword, and these were men of valor. But 600 men turned and fled toward the wilderness of the rock of Rimon, and they stayed at the rock of Rimon for four months, and the men of Israel turned back against the children of Benjamin, and they struck them down with the edge of the sword from every city, men and beasts, all who, found, all, all who were found, and they also set fire to the cities that they came to. So we have 600 men of the tribe of Benjamin. That's it. Only 600 men survived here, okay? Now, an entire tribe of Israel almost utterly destroyed. There's got to be something tragic. You might destroy God's plan because God had a blessing to the, through Jacob that Benjamin would somehow be used. Now then, verse uh, 1 of chapter 21, short chapter, we'll finish up. Now then the, the men of Israel had sworn an oath at Mizpah, their headquarters, saying, None of us shall give his daughter to Benjamin as a wife. Then the people came to the house of God, and they remained there before God till evening. They lifted up their voices and wept bitterly. Could you imagine? Uh, 25,000 Benjamites dead and 40,000 Israelites dead. And they said, Oh Lord, God of Israel, why has this come to pass in Israel? That today we, there should be one tribe missing in Israel. So it was on the morning that the people rose early and they built an altar there and they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. They had, it says that they made offerings, but it never says that God spoke to them or that they heard from God. It, it just says they made the offerings and they move on. Verse 5. The children of Israel said, Who is there among the tribes of Israel who did not come up with the assembly to the Lord? For they had made a great oath concerning anyone who had not come up to the Lord at Mizpah, saying, He shall surely be put to death. And the children of Israel grieved for Benjamin, their brother. And they said, One tribe is cut off from Israel today. What shall we do for wives for those men who remain, or those who remain? Seeing we have sworn by the Lord that we will not give them our daughters as wives. And they said... What one is there from the tribes of Israel who did not come up from Mizpah to Mizpah to the Lord? And in fact, no one had come from the to the camp from Jabesh Gilead, Jabesh Gilead to the assembly. For when the people were counted, indeed, no one from the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead was there. So this is even more tragic. So the congregation sent out 12,000 of their most valiant men and they commanded them saying, go and strike the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead with the edge of the sword. So now they're killing more of their own people including women and children. And this is the thing that you shall do. You shall utterly destroy every male, every woman, and everyone who has known a man intimately. So they found among the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead 400 virgins, 400 virgins that had not known a man intimately, and they brought them to the camp of Shiloh that, they, uh, that is in the land of Canaan. Then the whole congregation sent word to the children of Benjamin, who were at the rock of Rimon, and they announced peace to them. They said, hey guys, you survived. Peace to you. They gave these 400 women to the 400 men, but there were 200 men who still didn't have brides. As we see, they found a loophole. And there's a feast in verse 19, a yearly feast where the women would dance near Shiloh. And they allowed the Benjamites, the 200 Benjamites who didn't have brides, to go and steal a wife for themselves. So the conclusion, man's ways... Israel's 12 tribes were all disorderly, leading to cycles of sin and bondage and struggle. But there was redemption. But after that redemption, there grew complacency. God does not want us to be complacent. Let us pray. Father, as we conclude this book of Judges, where everyone did what was right in their eyes and there was no king over the land, we know today that everyone may be doing what is right in their own eyes, but you are the king who rules over all and we submit our lives to you today. Jesus, may you rule and reign in our hearts. May you rule and reign in this land. And may you rule and reign when there's perversity and perversion in our, our day. May we cut off sin. May we be holy and righteous unto you. And may we honor you and not harm our brethren. When we sin, we know other people hurt as well. So may we walk holy and righteous and blameless. And those who hear this message today that are outraged by the disgusting things that they saw today. May they want to live holy and righteous 
and be right with you that we may live in peace and live to help and love others rather than destroy and take life. Lord, we love you that you're the author of life. Protect us from Satan and his ways and guide us in your ways everlasting that we may trust you as our Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name we all say amen. Amen, amen guys.